So today's lecture, we're doing the invocation of Solomon. We did the two conjurations. And if you remember from the conjurations, we're facing west. And the idea is you're casting out the negative vibes. Now the invocation of Solomon is the opposite, facing east, bringing in the good vibes, basically. So we're casting out negative, negative entities from our internal nature and maybe from the external area around us. And with the invocation of Solomon, we're calling on powerful forces. So we're going to get into more names of angels and, and uh, more like the orders of angels and a lot of biblical references. So this is King Solomon. Here's a quote from attributed to King Solomon. Start with God. The first step in learning is bowing down to God. Only fools thumb their noses at such wisdom and learning. And as we'll see from uh, the invocation of Solomon, it's basically evoking God and all his different uh, divinities in their different degrees of kind of different degrees of power. It's really Kabbalistic, so we're going to be using the Tree of Life a lot again. And another quote from King Solomon, Naked a man comes from his mother's womb, and as he comes, so he departs. He takes nothing from his labor that he can carry in his hand. So the idea is that the work that we're doing in his wisdom relates to something not physical or material, but something internal, that basically the part of our essence that we can build on, and that kind of we carry with us, not so much and we'll get into it like the allegory of Solomon's temple, not as much being a physical thing as it is an internal thing, like everything in Gnosis and Kabbalah. We'll start with the wisdom of Solomon, because he was known as the wise King Solomon, and his wisdom was, this is a painting of King, uh, King Solomon, God talking to him in a dream. So this is from the Bible. The Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, and God said, Ask what shall I give thee? Solomon said, Give therefore thy servant an understanding heart to judge thy people, that I may discern between good and bad. For who is able to judge this thy so great a people? God said to him, Since you have asked for this, and not for long life or wealth for yourself, nor have asked for the death of your enemies, but for discernment in administering justice, I will do what you have asked. So I just picked this, this passage particularly because it shows what the wisdom of Solomon kind of pertains to really selflessness, not not egoistic at all, basically. And that's what made him so wise. Yes? What book is 1 Kings? From? It, it's 1 uh, Kings. There's 1 Kings and 2 Kings in the Bible. Okay, so the name of the book is 1 yeah. Kings? Yep. Yeah. Okay. And they usually show up. Yeah. Right? Yep, yeah, from the Bible. Is that a chapter? Like? Yeah, 1 <laughs> Kings chapter 3, verses 4 to 12 yeah. is where you'll find this. Yeah. Oh, so it's the Bible. Okay. It's the Bible, yeah. <laughs> oh. It's the Bible. <laughs> it's the Bible, yeah. <laughs> it's from the book. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> Okay, so now we're going to go to more of the, from stories that didn't quite make the Bible, but are, have been popular rabbinical texts. Um, in ancient rabbinical literature, there are stories of King Solomon acquiring power over demons. Uh, this, this book's all been referred to as the Testament of Solomon, or the Trees of Solomon. Um, he enslaves them and forces them to assist in the building of the famous King Solomon's temple, right, the first temple. A magic ring was given to Solomon, which allowed him to gain power over the demonic forces. Upon this ring was engraved the magic symbol that gave it power. This was the seal of Solomon. And we've talked about the seal of Solomon before, I believe, and we'll talk about it a little bit today, too. And the, this, they attribute the, the Lord of the Rings trilogy, that they got a lot of that, that idea from this original ancient text, mm -hmm. the Treaty of Solomon, because it talks about a ring and, and stuff and demons. And... So... We'll see that both the symbolism of the seal of Solomon and the symbolism of the ring itself are related to alchemy. We may have talked about this before. You may have talked about this in other phases. But the seal of Solomon represents the uniting of the two forces, fire and water, positive and negative, man and woman. And that's why the seal of Solomon is generally shown like this. If you see it like um, the way it's always used masonically or esoterically, it's always shown like this, two interlaced triangles. And the Star of David comes from that, but this is kind of like the flat one-dimensional one, you know, like like the Jewish Star of David just uh, looks like that, right? So it doesn't really look like they're interlaced, but they're just on top of the, one another. But this is the seal of Solomon, so. And it represents fire and water. It can also represent man, woman, uh, you know, the material and the spiritual uniting kind of has a lot of those kind of connotations. The ring represents the uniting of man, which is represented by the finger, which is a, like a phallic symbol, and the woman, is represented by the ring. When worn on the ring finger of the left hand, it represents the work in the ninth sphere, right? The alchemical work. That's why a lot of people in Gnosis will wear the 
wedding ring on their like their opposite hand, like their right hand opposite to what we're used to, basically. So it's a, it's just a just another symbol of alchemy, basically. So the wisdom of Solomon is related to Da'at, which is knowledge, the knowledge of alchemy. This is the knowledge that we're going to be talking about with Solomon. This is just a, a brief overview, and these texts that they're. they're they're really big, and they name a lot of demons and how he enslaved them and how he made them help with the temple and everything. And they're they're really long, but I just give a general overview because it kind of relates to what we're going to be talking about tonight. And these are engravings from from that work. Later engravings. So, through the use of the magical seal of Solomon, which we know is alchemy now, King Solomon is able to invoke and enslave demons. The demons that he subdues represent the egos. The egos are controlled by the seal of Solomon, alchemy. So work in the, in the ninth sphere is how we can eliminate, control, and subdue our ego. King Solomon then makes the demons, the egos, assist in building the glorious temple dedicated to God, King Solomon's temple. Is everybody with me? Mm -hmm. Not too complicated yet. Here's a, here's a Masonic picture. I thought I'd throw it in there. But that's King Solomon's temple in the background. And they're always pointing. Because there, there's two... In, in the history, there's been two main groups associated with King Solomon's Temple. There's been the Knights Templar, because that's the temple that they were associated to, and then the Freemasons, because everything in Freemasonry it revolves around the building, dedicating, of, and uh, yeah, building, the building and dedicating of the temple of King Solomon. But once the demons, the egos, are enslaved by the magical ring called the Seal of Solomon, which is alchemy, they are forced into labor at the building of the temple. Kind of reiterating what I just said before there. Uh, King Solomon's temple represents the solar bodies, the building of the solar bodies. Through alchemy, we eliminate ego, free essence, and transmute our sexual energies to create our solar bodies. So although it could, maybe it was a historical, actual fact that King Solomon's temple existed and all this, they have the ruins of the second temple, which are supposedly on top of the first temple. But the more important allegory or symbolism is what it means internally to, to us. And to that, the building of the temple is... The temple that will house God's presence, God being your Father who is in secret, and the temple being the solar bodies that can contain it. So once the temple, the solar body, is complete, God, or our Father who is in secret, descends and fills it with His presence. So that's where you get the saying, your body is a temple, because it actually is and when you're building it. And even Freemasonry, they always talk about dedicating your own temple, and that is a temple not built with hands, but a spiritual temple, celestial temple. So it's just a quick overview of Solomon because this invocation, the invocation of Solomon is attributed to King Solomon that he left, left it for us. And now we're going to talk a little bit about God and the angels because we're going to be talking a lot about that and the invocation itself. So first we'll talk about the angels. Uh, during the invocation of Solomon, specific names of angels are invoked. These names are related to certain orders of angels and not a singular specific angel. So we saw in the last... Uh, Conjurations, we'd be talking about Mikael and Gabriel and Raphael and particular angels. All the names that we, we, we are invoking are the orders of angels, like the orders that, say, Mikael would belong to. And um, each sephira on the Tree of Life has not only a specific name of God related to it, but a specific angelic order related to it as well. And in the Invocation of Solomon, we're going to be going sephira by sephira up the Tree of Life invoking not only the name of God for that specific realm, but also the angelic order for assistance. In Kabbalah, angels are seen as specific forces of God. We've talked a little bit about this, and not just the idea that they're um, these winged beings who exist only in that sense, which would be like the astral representation of them, but they're, a they're actual forces or laws of nature attached to God, and they have a specific job. And the idea of God, too, like I don't want to sound like I'm not... I'm just using God because we're all used to that term, but I mean, we're talking about the Ain Sof, kind of like the, a, the absolute abstract, if you want. I'm not trying to talk about it from a Judeo Christian point of view specifically. I just find it would be easier to say God than say the ab absolute abstract space. But I just want you guys to know I'm not being really fundamentalist on you here. We're talking about this force that we don't quite comprehend yet. So these Forces all serve specific functions according to God's plan, like the plan of creation from the total abstract to the total manifest. Um, now this is, I, I throw this in there just so we can illustrate this point. Uh, Mammonides was a famous, a really famous early catalyst. His name is Moshe ben Mammon, but they called him Mammonides because he always 
change the names of the rabbis or something to catch you, I guess. But he wrote a book, so. <laughs> Mammonites writes that to the wise man, one sees that what the Bible and Talmud refer to as angels are actually illusions for the various laws of nature. They are the principles by which the physical universe operates. And this book is called Guide of the Perplexed. We'll go a little bit more into it. For all forces are angels. How blind, how perniciously blind are the naive. If you told someone who reports to be a sage of Israel that the, de that the deity sends an angel who enters a woman's womb and there forms an embryo, he would think this is a miracle and accept it as a mark of the majesty and power of the deity. All this, he thinks, is possible for God. But if you tell him that God placed in the sperm the power of forming and demarcating these organs and that this is the angel or that all forms are produced by the active intellect, that here is the angel, the vice region of the world constantly mentioned by the sages, then he'll recoil. So it's the idea of going f like beyond the traditional interpretation of it being this, just this being. For he, the naive person, does not understand that the true majesty and power are in the bringing into being of forces which are active in a thing, although they cannot be perceived by the senses. Thus the sages reveal to the aware that the imaginative fa faculty is also called an angel and the mind is called a cherub. How beautiful this will appear to the sophisticated mind and how disturbing to the primitive. So um, the idea is that we're going to get beyond just the, the general understanding of what an angel is. And we've talked about this, like the idea that it represents an entire force. And that if you've seen an angel in the astral plane, it would appear definitely like that. And maybe you could see it in the physical plane. I'm not talking from experience or anything, but it will appear a certain way because that's the force that it is. And in the astral plane, we know is the plane of magic, the plane of symbolism, and we see it in its most symbolic and allegorical form. Now, to think that's the, the be-all and the end-all of what this entity is would be, would be kind of confusing the issue, for sure, because we know there's more to it. It goes up, you know, how we saw in Kabbalah, how it descends, when we saw the, the Kabbalistic Tree of Life, descends from the abstract to the concrete. Well, the astral is just like one step higher, but it's still closer to the concrete than it is to the abstract. So it's kind of like one small, tiny step more abstract, although it seems very abstract to us, because for us to go from the physical to the astral is a, a huge amount of work. But in the grand scheme of things, in the grand length of the work, we can see that it gets more abstract than that, for sure. But I just thought I'd put that in there so that we'd always... Sort of keep that in mind, because we don't want people to be starting to get confused and thinking that they've seen an angel, and this angel is the be-all and end-all of what this force is, if that makes sense. I mean, if there's any questions, we can talk this thing out. This isn't that long of a lecture, so we could have maybe more time. This is the angelic hierarchy, according to uh, the, the Tree of Life and the orders that we're going to be invoking. There's the Ishkin, the Cherubim, the Bnei Elohim, the Elohim, Malachim, Seraphim, Hashmalim, Arlim, Ophanim, and the Hail Hakadosh. So these are all orders of angels, and we'll talk about them individually as we as they come up in the uh, in the invocation itself. But the idea is that we're going from the most physical to the most abstract. So you can kind of see that they would, we could say, increase in holiness, although they all serve their own purpose in their own realm, kind of. And we're going to get into this more as the lecture goes on. Next, we'll talk about the name of God. So there's, there's, a, big, there's a big difference between the name of God in, in Hebrew and in English. And we talk about this a lot. Probably me and Ed talk about this a lot because even being Masons, the, the big thing of Masonry is talking about this particular subject. The idea that in the English translations, you're not going to really understand the true nature of divinity because it always gets translated as God or Lord. And it always alludes to the same thing, but there's totally different names being used in the Hebrew Bible that have different connotations, which we've, we've talked about, so it shouldn't be all too brand new. But during the invocation of Solomon, different names of God are invoked. These names are not different divinities exactly, but different aspects of God's attributes. So they're all different aspects of the same thing, this absolute, abstract, creative force. Each name of God invoked corresponds to a specific sephir on the tree of life, just like the orders of angels we just saw. These names increase in holiness as the ladder is ascended. The ladder being the tree of life. 
All these different names can be seen as different degrees of the same thing. That same thing being God, or the absolute abstract, or the Ainsoth. This whole creative principle, as it becomes more and more abstract. But it's a good idea to start trying to think more and more abstract and pushing the boundaries of your thought, because you can really exercise the old noodle that way for sure. So, here's the hierarchy of uh, the divine names of God. We're going to start with Shaddai. This is how they appear in the invocation, this way I put them in this order. Also, in Kabbalistic texts, they appear in this order also. In the Kabbalistic texts, particularly written by Mammonites, is why I put his name, his quote in there, because he, he pretty much invented this order. It's based on the Bible. So Shaddai, Adonai, Sabaoth, Tetragrammaton, obviously this one isn't from the Hebrew scriptures because it's Latin. And then Jehovah, which is also anglicized, so it's not from the Hebrew. And then Eloah, Elohim. And that's all the ones that we use in the... Uh, well, there's one other one we use, but these are the main ones we're going to use in the invocation of Solomon. But above and beyond that, there'd be Yah, then there'd be the yod heh vav -Hey, and then the, the highest one is Ahie, Asher Ahie. So, uh, mostly in, in like Judaism, this is the most holy name we talk about all the time, yod heh vav -Hey. That's the most holy name, and most of the other names will cover that, or a lot, a lot of times we'll be alluding to that. Like, well, we'll get into it. The Tetragrammaton itself means four letters, and it's talking about these four. So, Jacob's Ladder, which we talked about a little bit before, we can see at the top, there's God, there's all the angels ascending, descending. Jacob's Ladder is the tree of life. In the Bible, it's, it's, that's what it's referencing. It is a tree of life. The ladder is the sephiroth that the messages come up and down, and beings are ascending and descending through these spheres of existence. And we'll just maybe give a brief overview of, of that story in case people don't overly know it. This is really brief, by the way. But in the book of Genesis, the biblical patriarch Jacob falls asleep on a rock and has a dream vision of a divine ladder that reaches from earth to heaven. At the top of this ladder is God, which in the Hebrew is the yod heh vav -Hey. In ascending and descending, this ladder are angels. The ladder is depicted by the tree of life diagram. God is at the top because all... Things emanate from this primal source, this absolute abstract, which we're calling God. But we already have a bigger idea of what that could imply. The angels are the messengers of God going up and coming down the ladder. And the reason why the messengers is in quote is, as we'll see, most times when you come across angel in the Bible, it's this Malach, Malachi, Malachi, which means messenger. And it doesn't, it's not always attributed to only angels, but on every angel... It's an angel of God. It's actually literal translation, the messenger of God. So that's where we get that idea. In order to return to God, we must climb Jacob's ladder. So that's the idea, is that climbing up through the sephira back to the source. Is, uh, is Jacob, or the story of Jacob, um, are only described in the book of Genesis, or are there other symbolic um, stories of the, a character similar to mm -hmm. Jacob in, in other texts? Um... The, the latter itself only really appears in the book of Jacob, I believe. There are some other texts where they talk about a plumb line, which has the same connotation as Jacob's ladder, but a, the exact text on that one, I'm not 100%. I think it's Amos, the book of Amos. It okay. talks about a plumb line uniting heaven and earth. Um, and then there's lots of commentary, like post-biblical commentary, by ancient Kabbalists writing about Jacob's ladder and that. Kind of, like the Zohar, pretty much the 21 texts of the, the Kabbalistic Zohar, is expounding basically on Jacob's ladder and the ten Sephiroth and how they're related. Most of the most Kabbalistic texts relate to this. So if you remember from the Kabbalah lecture, which was pretty intense, I know most of the Sephiroth are related to specific names in the Bible, like Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. They're all related to specific Sephiroth. So everything in Kabbalah is related to that diagram, basically. In the entire Bible, they connect it to that diagram, which and they interpret it the same way we interpret the Christian scriptures as more allegory for a true things that happen in everybody's internal constitution as opposed to the importance of it being a historical fact is is not as important as what the implications means to each individual and how we would uh, you know implement that into our lives so during the invocation of Solomon we climbed the ladder three times so now we're going to get into it and I feel like we're flying through this lecture but uh this lecture also, the Master Samuel didn't, didn't leave a lot of information about just the, the importance of doing it. So we, I did a lot of independent research and a lot of stuff, but it might be one of the shorter lectures that we're going to do. So give us more time for uh, lunches.
<laughs> or questions, you know, we can talk it out too. So, Jacob's Ladder, the Tree of Life, round one. During the first round of the Invocation of Solomon, we are calling upon the attributes of the Sephiroth of the Pillar of Mercy and the Pillar of Justice. If you remember uh, from the lecture, that's the left hand and the right hand pillar of the Tree of Life. These two pillars represent the masculine and feminine, positive and negative, and giving and restricting attributes of the absolute abstract space, or God, or the Ainsaw. Through the balancing of these forces, we, we unite the king, which is shown as Keter, the highest sephira, with the kingdom, Malkuth, the lowest one. And that's the whole point, basically. In a nutshell, that's the entire work of Gnosis. That's what we're trying to do, the same as in the Kabbalah. It's, a, it's, a, an, it's the great work. It's what we're trying to do. Have the king run the kingdom. We're in the kingdom right now. But the, the kingdom's been taken over by a host of demons, which we call the egos. And that's where we get our uh, sense of individuality and everything from. But the main goal is to eliminate the egos, create the solar body so that the king, the highest Sephiroth, can incarnate in, and use this as an instrument for his will and not our will, which is egoistic in nature. So we'll get into it now. Maybe you want to turn the lights up a little bit. Doris. I'm sorry to make you work so much here. But then we can read along. So the first line is, Powers of the Kingdom. Be ye beneath my left foot and within my right hand. There might be some variations. Maybe it doesn't say ye or something in there. But, but there's a couple different. They're all pretty similar. So powers of the kingdom. Be beneath my left foot and within my right hand. Here's our favorite picture of all time from all the lectures. And uh, Malkuth is the attribute of the kingdom, right? So powers of the kingdom. You know, li the literal translation of Malkuth is kingdom. This is what we're talking about. We're talking about this sphere specifically. The left foot and the right hand represent the two pillars, mercy being on the right and justice being on the left. So in this line we are calling the powers of the physical world to balance us between the two opposing forces. So we can be thinking of it as the external forces of the material world and the internal forces of our own physical body, basically. We're trying to, we're trying to live between mercy and justice, which is this idea of, you know, how the, the pendulum and then the Buddhist middle path, it's the same kind of idea, not to be at one extreme or another extreme, but to be within these two opposing forces. Okay, next line is, glory and eternity, touch my shoulders and guide me on the path of victory. So Hod is the attribute of glory, and there's a second emotion of restricting, right? So now we're still talking about this left hand pillar. Netzach is the attribute of victory and endurance, it is a secondary emotion of giving, so that's related to the eternity. And these two opposing forces, when touching the shoulders, would place the body in line with the center path. So if you can imagine the shoulders would be here, and the center of the body would be like walking the middle path here. Same, so it's got the same connotation as the last one, where we're striving for a balance between the two opposing forces. By balancing the forces of giving and restricting, we remain on the path of victory. And you can see what we're doing here in this first round also, maybe I should mention, is we're, we're calling on this, this individual Sephira, basically, but in their English names, right? So, Hod is literally glory in English, and Eternity is literally Netzach. Eternity, Endurance, Victory are all Netzach, so we are talking about this specifically. Mercy and Justice, be the equilibrium and splendor of my life. Hased is the attribute of loving kindness or mercy. And it's the primary emotion of giving. If you remember, remember we did the emotions, the instincts, the intellect, all that stuff from the, from the Kabbalah lecture. I brought it back for this one. And Gabur is the attribute of strength or justice. It is the primary emotion of restricting. Um, between the forces of the pillar of mercy and the pillar of justice, we find balance, which we refer to as the pillar of equilibrium. We have the pillar of mercy, the pillar of justice, the pillar of equilibrium. So they're still talking about the same thing. You see how we're going? We're going up the tree right now, but we're all continuously talking about the center line of it. This is just for more background information for when you're doing these, you don't feel like they're just words that don't mean anything. Because there is a lot of meaning to them. And uh, we'll see why. So intelligence and wisdom, give unto me the crown. Bina is the attribute of understanding or intelligence. Because it literally means, understanding literally means Bina, Hebrew, English. Translation. Hokma is the attribute of wisdom, the literal, literal translation. And by balancing these forces, we are given the crown, which is keter, which is literally translated as crown. 
So we're talking about basically Hina and Hokma give me Keter, basically, is what it's at, what it would be saying if we read it in Hebrew. And this being the highest, the highest sephira, the highest spiritual source um, before going back to the one source. So Keter is linked to Malkuth, equilibrium, through the uh, sorry, Malkuth, which is kingdom, through the pillar of equilibrium. Yeah, that's why. The whole idea is uniting these two, and we're using we're using the whole opposite forces and balancing them to unite those two forces. So in the first four lines of the Invocation of Solomon, we are invoking the opposing attributes so that we may gain balance between them. But in line one, we have balance of the physical world of action. In line two, balance of the lower instinctual emotional powers, right? Because remember, this was a triangle of the instincts. In line three, we're balancing the higher emotional faculties, which had to do with morality and virtue. Then in line four, we're balancing the intellectual faculties and powers. To uh, then that brings us to Keter, which is united to Malkuth through the central path. Is the idea. So you can kind of picture that, like we're calling on these specific attributes or forces, external and internal, to come into a state of balance. It's the idea that we've cast out all these negative, all our negative emotions and all these negative entities and egos. And now we're trying to call on the higher positive spiritual forces represented by the Sifra. Now, Jacob's Ladder, the Tree of Life, round two. This is going to be the shortest lecture in history, I think. <laughs> so, during the second round of the Invocation of Solomon, we are calling upon the different aspects of God to help us ascend. So, different aspects of the infinite. Yes. I have a question. Yes, ask away. <laughs> okay. Let's talk this thing out. All right. Well, there was there was uh, in one of these uh, other meetings I went to. There was uh, uh, there are these two people, Esther Hicks and her husband. I forget their name. And I think they've written books. And they've said like you know, ask and you shall receive. But mm -hmm. they said don't keep asking over and over again. Just you know, just ask once. They know like you know. And so why do we have to like how much repetition like do we have to. Like this invocation, like how many times do we have to go through this before mm -hmm. actually anything happens to us? Like three thousand times or well, five thousand or yeah. like I, I don't know. It just seems to me like why so much and doesn't anybody listen? Well, it seems Words? like it's because the idea of what we're really doing is trying to cleanse our own ego to receive spiritual. Uh, we usually do it before meditation, before sleep, so we can have positive uh, med meditative experiences or astral experiences. And the idea is that. We are constantly at battle with the ego, and it's constantly coming back. Because we don't just say, we can't just say, I want to get rid of my ego, and then just wait for them to do so it. We know it's a work that we have to, to do ourselves. So are successful at completely getting rid of the ego, or are we mm -hmm. going to, like, three months down, something's going to make us angry, like, you know? Yeah, it, 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 it's, it's a constant struggle, and it's a constant work. So it is, it is a lot so of just, work, but the idea is that you're constantly on this path, constantly doing this work. So, like, for me personally, I do these twice a day sometimes. Depends on meditating and then before I go to sleep, so sometimes three times a day. It's only because it gets me in the proper state for meditation where I'm starting to say, okay, you know, I have a lot of internal demons, these egos, so I'm calling on these higher spiritual forces that are, you know, they penetrate me, they're inside and outside of me, trying to bring me into equilibrium first so I can receive it because I feel like if I, if I don't have help from above, then my ego will be too strong for me to even recognize it. And then if you can't recognize it, you can't start to fight it, is the idea. So the battle with the ego is a long battle. It is a long, long mm -hmm. battle. And it's the biggest job we basically have in the physical world. But doesn't it get easier as you get older? Because people, I mean, young kids are always impatient. They want <laughs> everything now and, and it, it greedy depends. and everything. Yeah. And as you get older, you just kind yeah. of... <laughs> yeah, sure, but the, it's that's something. Yeah, you know? they would argue that old people, get, old, older people, get set in their ways, and their ways are generally like so everybody's ways are egoistic. Be, yeah, and even the idea of, of like when we're doing stuff for good and stuff, there's still ego there. There's still egos there that that are really manipulative and really tricky. We don't even understand the egos, like the psychological moon. So that like the moon has a dark side we can't see. Ego is the same way. So like. I gotta use that example. Maybe I'm up here because I want to help everybody learn something, or maybe I just want to seem like I know a lot of stuff. And it's hard, it's hard to know teach. which one. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's hard to know which one. It's another, yeah. Another thing that that I that I usually attribute to, to something like other repetition of anything mm -hmm. is is it it becomes a part of your subconscious. 
So let's say you, for example, um, meditate and do the, the invocation of these conjurations on a daily basis, then the, the chance or the occurrences of that actually happening when you're in a dream, just by, by nature of like subconscious and uh, thing, it happens in the astral and then it, mm -hmm. it brings about that awareness. So if you do it in the sub, if you do it in the physical, then it carries into your subconscious as well. Mm -hmm. And then once you start to have dreams uh, that you're doing it just out of the, even if it's just the repetition of the the physical act, then um, then it when you did that in the astral, whether or not you were conscious, it would bring about consciousness or awareness in your dreams. So mm -hmm. I would, like that's usually one of the thing that works. One of the most important things too about this, like even on the most smallest, most fundamental level, of what this whole thing is doing, the conjurations and the invocations, it, it's cultivating a sense of devotion to something higher than yourself, like all prayer, but this is kind of going a bit further, because if you, you start to become attached to it at first, and maybe at first it's mechanical, but you feel like, hey, I'm praying these higher things that are higher and above and beyond myself, and that's really fundamental in this work, because we're talking about trying to eliminate the ego, which in essence is the self that we know right now, and incarnating our higher self, which isn't our self, basically, to, to the state of, of mindset we're at. Do you understand what I'm saying? Right now, our mindset is basically the ego. We're identified with the ego, and I think of myself as this Canadian man, you know, stuff that really I'm not, because the spirit, uh, father isn't secret, isn't any of these things, but a spiritual principle. So we're kind of cultivating uh, devotion to higher aspect of ourselves, which we need in this work, because that's what we're trying to basically do. We're basically trying to eliminate ourselves as we know it, this ego, egoic self, and incarnate a higher self, which could seem like somebody totally different to us. doesn't feel like ourselves. So that's just one thing. But I know what you're saying. It's like, what is it? Repetitions, just by saying it over and over and yeah, over again, it's going to bring some... I don't, I don't believe... It that, just reminds yeah. me of the, you know, the, the, the Christian stuff. You know, yeah. Going there, like yeah. The, very, really the dogmatic. Yeah. Right? Like, yeah. how many, you know, like, and I just yeah. thought it was so, you know, pointless yeah. to me. Yeah, it seems mechanical and dogmatic. Yeah, and just, you yeah. know, like a so the kind of rote yeah. kind of thing. It's really yeah. Just, yeah it's the just, idea here is that you're cultivating devotion so you can have a platform to start experiencing higher things and higher uh, perceptions, start forming higher questions and start receiving higher answers. Is the, is the main aspect of this. Sounds good? So, uh, God's powers. <laughs> Did you buy that? <laughs> Did you believe it? Yeah. Come on with more questions. We'll talk this thing out all night long. Sure. Don't you have any questions? So, uh, God's powers, the macrocosmic and the microcosmic, are called upon to assist with the middle path in the second, second round. So, macrocosmic being, you know, external around us, and then the microcosmic being our, our own internal universe of the psychology in that. We call upon the angels and powers of the particular Sephiroth, as well as God's own power, to assist us with the work of the pillar of equilibrium again. And we'll see as we get into it here. So, the next line is, Spirits of Malkuth, conduce me between the two columns upon which is supported the whole edifice of the temple. So now, obviously, we're back at the bottom again. We just, last one we ended up on Keter, and now we're back to Malkuth. So the Spirits of Malkuth, the powers and forces that inhabit this level of, of existence of Malkuth, both the physical world and the physical body, are being invoked to guide us on the path of equilibrium. The path of equilibrium comes up a lot. It's called different things in different cultures, but the middle path, the, the middle way, you know, that's kind of like the Buddhist interpretation of it. But also, so the pillar of mercy and the pillar of justice are referred to as the two columns in this line. Conduce me between the two columns. Right? So we got, and these are the two pillars of Solomon's Temple, Boaz and Jachin. And a lot of uh, Masonic temples and stuff, you'll see you always have to walk between these two pillars, and usually there's a triangle on top. It has the same sort of reference. The idea is that we're wa you're walking this path through the, the gateway, if you can imagine. Because this being the edifice of the temple. The edifice of the temple is the separatic crown of Keter, Hochman, and Vina, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. That's the edifice of the temple. So saying, you know, kind of walking through the doorway, the, the whole supporting aspect of the highest <coughs> points of existence. That's basically what that line is talking about. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Maybe if somebody sees something else in there. I'm open, I'm open for interpretation, too. So. I'm not a fascist dictator or anything up here. <laughs> so, then we got angels of Netzach and of Hod strengthen me upon the cubicle stone of Yassad. So 
Now we're talking about the specific angels of Netzach and Had, those two Sifra. So the angels of Netzach and Had, which we said are the messengers of God in this level of existence, are being invoked specifically to help us upon the middle Sephira between them. So not only the middle path now, but we're asking Netzah and Had to help us with the Asad, right? So the Sephira and the pillar of equilibrium between Had and Netzah is the Asad. Here we are invoking these angels to help specifically with the great work in the ninth sphere in alchemy. So these two extremes to help us with this particular Sephira. Here you can see that. Angel of Netzach and of Had, strengthen me upon the cubical stone of Yassad. We're not really invoking the angels of Yassad. That's the, that's the path we have to work with. And these are the forces, the two extreme forces that we're trying to bring into balance. So we can have success in this, in the ninth sphere, Yassad. Yes? So that's interesting because um, when we are doing the great work in the ninth sphere, we are trying to... Uh, with the basis of the Yesod, the yeah. cubic stone, mm -hmm. uh, we are trying to build uh, the the solar bodies. Right. Uh, Netzah, yeah. Hot, yeah, and the others. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. So we have we work with Yesod builds a you know first I guess would be the solar astral and then the solar mental and that. But the idea is that Yesod is the foundation of building those bodies. So we're asking basically. You can also see it maybe more of a materialistic way and less mystical is like your passions and your desires and your intellectual your thoughts and, and your, your all everything when you're working with your side you're trying to balance these so you don't want to have the negative vulgar animalistic thoughts you don't want to have the negative animalistic passions and the egos represented by the astral and the mental when you're working with the with the ninth sphere you want to have try and have elevated first of all you want elevated emotions obviously or you're going to not be successful and you want an elevated thought also the mental body you want to have an elevated thought process you don't want to be thinking about working in the ninth sphere and then oh I just want to satisfy myself you know you don't want those kind of thoughts and you don't want to be carried away by your passions either if what you're trying to do is work in alchemy for sure and that's what this specific line is trying to invoke these powers the external powers and then the intellectual and, and emotional powers when doing this specific work so you can, be, you can be taken on a lot of different levels. We can talk about the different levels for sure. I don't want you guys to think that just the way I've written it is the only way it could be understood. Because I'm not a master. Right? I'm just trying to open up our doors of perception so we can understand a little bit more about the teachings. But in the end, I feel like, oh, it's okay, I'll do my part, but it's up to you guys. <laughs> so Everybody's got to carry their own cross or do their own work, right? So we like to help for sure. So then we're going to say, O Gadulayel, O Gaburayel, O Tiferet. Right? Now we, we see some familiar words and maybe some not so familiar words in this one. So, Gadula is synonymous with Hased in Kabbalah and it's often interchanged. It means the same thing as, as mercy. So, Gadula, sometimes Hased is called Gadula. So, it's Gadula and Gabura. Uh, Gabura is severity, justice, or strength, and Tifereth is beauty, right? But, We'll notice here that we're not saying O Gadula, O Gabura, O Tifereth. We're saying O Gadulael, O Gaburael, O Tifereth. Of God. Of God. We got it. Ah. Yeah, so we're specifically going, in this line, we're not calling upon the attributes of the Sephiroth themselves, but on these attributes of God specifically. And only from these two, right? Gadulael, Gaburael, and then Tifereth isn't, isn't said as Tifereth-el. So, so or Tifereel, however you'd say that. So this is... We're trying to work in our own beauty, like in that, which is basically the human soul, through these powers of God, through the mercy and justice of God specifically. Of, so Gadula, Gadula equals mercy, right? Good love, that's Gadula. And God is El. Gabura is strength and justice. Gabura and of God is El. So every time you see El, we've talked about that, like Gabriel. Even G Gabriel is Gabura El, the strength of God is what his name literally translates, and Mikael is the likeness of God, Raphael is the healing of God, because El is of God. So, I mean, it doesn't, it's not important to know all the, like the Hebrew that El means God, but it, it does help you when you're reading these things to know that we're talking about an attribute of the divine, you know, source, if you can look at it that way. So, through God's mercy and justice, we achieve beauty. So, we're evoking basically, it's not, not, not even like just God's mercy and justice, but you know, 
higher mercy and justice that exist outside of ourselves so that we can achieve them. Maybe they don't exist within ourselves right now. Maybe we don't have this divine idea of mercy. We don't have this divine idea of justice. Maybe they're tainted with ego. But we're trying to invoke these higher principles of uh, like the most pure aspects of mercy and justice so we can be between those two pillars, between those two extremes, and through there we'll have a... We'll, you know, realize our human soul, or at least a portion of beauty where we can maybe start to meditate from, where we're not too subjective. And then we have, Be thou El, Be Thou My Love, Ruach, Hokmael, Be Thou My Light. <coughs> so more Hebrew, more Hebrew, more Hebrew. <laughs> so, in this line, we are once again invoking the attributes of God specifically. Whenever, like we said, whenever we say El, that's of the divine, right? So Bina is understanding, El is God, the understanding of God. The understanding of God, or God's understanding, be my love. Right? Ruach, or Ruach, is, we translate in English as spirit. The literal translation is breath. So, but what the word, the word spirit comes down from the Hebrew Ruach. So, Ruach Chokma, which is wisdom, El, God. So, the spirit of the wisdom of God, be thou my light. So, here we are asking for illumination and realization through, through God's <coughs> understanding and wisdom. And like I said, when we talk about gods, we can talk about the higher, the higher spiritual aspects of understanding and wisdom that maybe don't, don't exist within us. But because Binael, God's understanding, be my love. You want to have that highest possible, uh, you know, attribute of understanding, the most selfless, the most pure, and then the spirit of wisdom to be the light. We want to be guided by true wisdom and not this foolish wisdom that's tainted by ego. Be that which thou art, and that which thou willest to be, O Katiriel. So here we're going back to using L again, too. So Katiriel is crown of God. Keter is related to the will. That's why it's be which thou willest. In this line, we are invoking the will of God to act through us according to its divine plans and not through our own egoistic nature. <coughs> it can be seen more of, like, here we are transcending our own will, or the ego, to invoke the divine will of God, who can be seen as our Father, who is in secret. You know, so that's why it's, thy will be done, thy, and thy kingdom come, in, in the Christian prayer. That's the exact same thing as what we're talking about. Thy kingdom come, the kingdom is Malkuth. You know, thy will is this highest will, Keter, the crown. Okay, so that was, that was round two. Here's the round two overview. In the second round of the Invocation of Solomon, we are invoking the angels and forces of God from the two opposing pillars to help us with the particular sephiroth on the pillar of equilibrium. So it's like the, <coughs> sort of like round one. Except for in round one, we weren't asked for help for a specific sephiroth like we are in round two. We were just like, round one, in round one it was the general, help us on balance. Now it's like, that's a <coughs> hook us up with the Assad kind of thing. So the spirits of Malkuth assist in the center path. This is like, this is just the overview. The angels of Netzah and Had assist with Yasad. Gedulael and Geburael assist with Tiferet. Binael and Hokmael assist with reaching Keteriel, the crown of God. And then we see they're connected again through this middle path. This is kind of like the biggest thing of this invocation. It seems like it's going over and over again, but that, that's what keeps coming up in the invocation of Solomon, the importance of this balance or this path. And we'll talk, oh, here, this is an interesting one I just sort of threw in there, because we talked about the middle path being the path to God, and this is Kabbalistically, but remember when we talked about Kabbalah, we, we touched on gematria, the idea that every letter is related to a number also in Hebrew. So we can see that here, where if you take the center sephira, you got the, fir the first sephira, the sixth, the ninth, and the tenth. And then this is the sacred name, yod heh vau -Hey, when it's arranged vertically, it looks like a man, so they like to do that. And the, the Yod equals ten in Gematria, the He is five, the Vav is six, and the He is five again. And both of them equal twenty-six. So in Kabbalah, they're always attributed to being related to one another. So the middle path is the path to God, is because through Gematria, they say that through this path, it's related to that name. This path is related to that name. And Gematria is really confusing, first of all, say, because I don't understand all of it, but, but they, they draw a lot of extra definitions of names and words based on the numbers. 
So if one word has the same numerical value as another, they say that both words are related. So, like, yes? I took a book out a long time ago on numerology. Yeah. So would it have been from, from this? Yeah, this is numerology good? originates from Gamatria for sure, basically. Um, because, now what difference does it make? Like, if you go, especially women, when they marry, like, if you keep your main mm -hmm. name or if you use your married name, if it's... Is it better? Like it seemed to me, some of the letters in the maiden name were better. Like yeah. the higher value. Like does it? So that means yeah. you have more more good fortune. Sure. Or, or? I spent a lot of time reflecting on that subject, numerology myself, because I, it's one of the ones that I've, I've personally had a little more trouble with. So other people use it a lot and swear by it. Mm -hmm. But in my mind, I have ideas like. I was just curious. Our dates been just... changed in the past, you know. So your what? The dates been changed, and if you use the Hebrew year, it's the year six thousand, not the year two thousand. Mm. So it seems like it's a little bit subjective to me that way. But the only way I can maybe justify it is that for 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 higher spiritual forces that we don't understand, for reasons we don't really comp comp comprehend, we have maybe met this person, got married, and changed our name, and that has changed our spiritual numbers, basically. But if you're no longer with that person, you're still having holding on to that name. You maybe should not. Uh, yeah, I wouldn't be an authority on saying whether you should or whether you shouldn't, because uh, numerology to me is, is, a, is a little bit of a vague. What are you avoiding? <laughs> vague, yeah. It's vague to me. It seems like, you, like for that kind of reason, you could come up with different. Uh, mm -hmm. There is going to be a lecture on numerology because Master Samuel mm -hmm. had a whole numerological process that you can follow mm -hmm. and everything, but we'll get into that. But I think Ed's really into that stuff. So for me I was I started getting into Kabbalah a lot and they say, well, you know, for numerology to be right, you have to first translate everything into Hebrew because mm -hmm. the Hebrew letters have specific numbers that don't correlate with the English letters and I don't know. I don't know. It's mm -hmm. not I felt it hasn't helped me overly with my ego, and that's what I've mostly been focusing on. Yeah, so yeah. I just kind of yeah, you know, push numerology aside. But Wolfgang knows a ton about numerology. Mm -hmm. He oh, swears by it, so he, he's really big wow. into it. Well, I'll ask him questions. He, he would he would know for sure. He's the guy to ask. But he'd probably have to say, I could give you a Wolfgang. What, uh, what do you think is best you should do? Because he's not going to step on anybody's free will either. You know? But he'll have some more insight than me for sure. So now we're going to go to round three. Nice. Jacob's Ladder, the Tree of Life, round three, the final round. Dun, dun, dun. So here, I just picked this picture because we see God, you know, the idea of God sitting between the sun and the moon, so the two opposite pillars, and the angels below him with his feet on the earth, Malkuth, so it kind of was symbolic. This picture is taken from uh, Ezekiel's vision, which basically the entire next uh, round all relates to Ezekiel's vision, because... Uh, most of the angels, the orders of angels, and everything all appear in the book of Ezekiel. And the book of Ezekiel is one of the, the most Catholic and Gnostic books in the Bible. The book of Ezekiel, you know, the book of Revelations and Genesis, particularly, are the most Catholic or Gnostic. And, yes? Um, <clears throat> so I'm familiar with all the symbols and what they represent, mm -hmm. except for the one on the bottom left, bottom the left. circle with yeah. the uh, spokes. Yeah. Uh, what is that supposed to represent? Well, that's, the, that's Ezekiel's wheel that he saw in the sky. Okay. It's part of the entire vision. We'll talk about it a little bit, because it's, it's one of the orders of angels, the Ophanim, which means wheel. But he saw these beings, these four-headed beings, wherever they went, the wheel went, and they were inside the wheel, and the wheel turned not which way it went, and it's all really confusing stuff. So, I mean, maybe you'd have to experience Ezekiel's vision to understand the exact... <laughs> so, so does it have some, some sort of relation to the wheel of samsara, or is it... It, it may. He talks about it, it's wheels intersecting wheels intersecting wheels. Okay, and, uh, I, I could, I mean, in my own mind, just by that description, yeah, I, I can definitely see or understand uh, the idea of it being a higher force. Uh, sure, yeah, absolutely. Like, uh, like uh, cycles within cycles. Yeah, cycles within cycles. Within cycles, within cycles, within cycles. Yeah, within cycles. In the astral plane, if you ever look at the night sky in the astral plane, you see some crazy stuff that sometimes to me it looks like, but, you know... Being subjective. Being you know subjective. where that picture is from? The top one? Sorry, yeah. Justin. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, no. The top no, picture? No. I, yeah. What's, where uh, I can get you the information because I have it saved on my computer. Oh, okay. We love that picture. Yeah, we yeah. want to know where it's from. Okay, yeah. I, have it on, I have it on my computer at home. It's probably in color, is it, or is it in black and white? It's in black and white because I think it might be an etching. It might be. Oh, okay. It might not be actually oh, a painting. Cool. So oh, it would be nice. like Adam Cadmon or like yeah. a more better representation of it. Sure, exactly. That's, that's kind of why I think that's what I get the idea. Angels are balloon. And a lot of times, too, you, you hear about the covenant, the Ark of the Covenant. It means mercy seat. They always talk about the idea of being a seat because God has to lower himself.
himself on him. <laughs> to reveal himself. Here. And here you have him sitting there too. And yeah. Yeah, the arch That's of the head. And then you see behind him, obviously, is like the absolute he's abstract he's space. So I really like this picture a lot. That's a good picture. What does it look like? Just the little in the corner. Oh, that one. Oh, okay. Okay. So during the third round of the Invocation of Solomon, we are invoking each individual angelic order in the specific in the specific name of God for each of the Sephiroth. Sephiroth. So there's a specific angelic order, like we said, and a specific name, the ones we talked about before when I had the, the Tree of Life there and it came up in a circle and looked really cool. Now we're going to talk about them because this is where they come up. So each Sephira has a specific angelic order and a specific divine name attached to it. The names of the angelic orders are mostly found in the book of Ezekiel, one of the most mystical doctrines of the Bible. Some of them are found in the book of Isaiah. But, I mean, this is just more for background information. I had to present something for you. So I, I, I picked a lot of Bible quotes where you can find them and maybe meditate on what these actual things mean because they're deep for sure. So the very first one is, Ishkim, assist me in the name of Shaddai. So here we're talking about the Sephira Malkut again. Remember, we ended at the top. We're going back down to the bottom. That's why I got the three rounds. So Malkut is a kingdom. The angelic order is called the Ishkim, which translates as loosely like man-like beings. They're like, so that would be like the least angelic, you know? We're thinking, so if we think, but they are, they are angels. They're higher than men, but they're men-like beings, sort of thing, is what they would appear to us. And in the book of Daniel, it is, I then lifted up my eyes and looked, and behold a man, which is Ishkim, so it's not really the name for man, but it's like this man-like being, the angel Ishkim. His face was like lightning and his eyes like torches of fire, and the sound of his words were as the noise of a multitude. This is just a reference, or one of the specific references where this order comes from, so you don't think we're just making this stuff up. But uh, then we can talk about the divine name. The divine name is Shaddai, which means Almighty. Sometimes it's also related to of the mountain, and usually it's, it, it, it appears as El Shaddai, or God Almighty, or God of the mountain. The mountain can be seen as the the latter also. So generally found in the Bible is El Shaddai, God Almighty, being the name of the God of Israel, Yohei Valhe, as known by the patriarchs. So there's a story that, um, I think it's when, I don't, I don't know what inside note, but like the patriarchs being Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the name that was revealed to them for God was El Shaddai, and they always referred to him as El Shaddai. And it has more Babylonian context, the, the name El, and as we know, the Hebrews came from Babylon, so it could be it could be linked that way. So, what are those three names again? Um, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Those is, are the, is that the same Jacob uh, that sees the ladder? Yep, that's the same. Okay. He's the son of Isaac, and Jacob is the same Jacob who also fights an angel, and then asks the angel for its name. He beats the angel. The angel says, "I'm not giving you his name," but then he changed Jacob's name to Israel. So there's a lot of connotation that he incarnated his higher father, Israel, and then. The Hebrew tradition came from Jacob, the patriarch. Yes? Why do so many people have to be so scary, like the face, scary. like lightning eyes, like torches I think, of fire? What yeah. is all that? Well, the oh, idea is they're trying to use uh, physical, material words to describe something that's a spiritual. So we only have the language of this world to describe this. But it'd be hard to imagine somebody with a face like lightning. But these spiritual beings have these are beyond sort of our comprehension in a physical material sense. So I think But is that supposed to be like a negative image? Because no. it seems because it's if it were I mean, something yeah. pleasant, like I can't imagine kids looking at something like that. No. So but that, that's why we start with like so you can see you, everyone knows what a cherub looks like, right? Yeah. Yeah, but that's only a Christian interpretation. The cherubs look, don't look like that at all in the Bible. But yeah. I think it's the way of easing people into the idea. First you get the idea that this cherub is like a baby in this beautiful mm -hmm. baby. Maybe mm -hmm. it's because it's a smaller, uh, less powerful force of God. We're trying to, you can't teach a baby about cabal, you know, it's hard enough for us to learn about it. So we have to learn yeah. through the allegories of the Bible and the stories. Now this stuff's probably getting closer to the truth, but there's probably a lot of allegory in there too. To decipher it is, is would be the hard part, but we're well, talking. Would be his opinion. Yeah, the yeah. Would be but the book of I'm still things. saying, like, if they're they're mm -hmm. sort of good good um, yeah. um, beings, then why do they have these? Like, to me, those aren't very pleasant images. Sure. Torches of fire. Yeah. Couldn't they have more 
pleasant eyes? Like, I don't Maybe, know. Maybe, but you know yeah, I do know what you're saying. Your cherubs, like, why can't the cherubs, yeah. the, like, the cherubs, we, we They're described so. in the Bible and nothing like that. Nothing but, uh, like that. So but, I mean, I the why, idea, I why think. why everything is so, sure. so hard in those days. Like, is it just think, from the time? Well, the idea is that the idea of good and bad for us is really subjective. Like, for me, it wouldn't be good if I walked out and got hit by a car and broke my leg. I mean, this would be a really bad thing. Mm -hmm. But if that's my karma and it brings me back into equilibrium with what I've done, maybe I use this leg to kick somebody in a bar fight and now I'm paying karma to equilibrium. <laughs> it doesn't, doesn't, do nothing like, about. Right? It doesn't, yeah. doesn't seem good at the time, but in the grand scheme of things, it's good because it's bringing me into a state of equilibrium. You know, So what appears to be bad or negative to us in the physical world is done basically for a reason. All the reasons are, in the end, good. Even the idea of hell is good because it's purging with us of our ego. But since we're so attached to our ego, we're like, oh, why am I being in pain right now and everything? It's, well, it's not you that's in pain. You're the essence trapped in the ego, identifying yourself with this ego that has to be purged. And because you're identified with the ego, you feel it as pain. That's kind of the idea. So our idea of good and bad are skewed here. We can't see the whole picture. That's why. That's the, you know, that's just the, the problem of being in Malkuth, the physical world, the, the last most concealed uh, you know, realm of reality, basically. So it could be something like that. The idea that these things are have these great things, to me it implies that, that they're above and beyond the, the material human being, and that, that they are associated with greatness and these attributes that we can't quite understand. Like maybe they're talking about spiritual forces, his face is like the lightning, maybe his face was like the spiritual force of lightning that we don't understand yet. Maybe lightning is beautiful. Yes, yeah. maybe. Yeah, his eyes were like Fire torches. Like they're, yeah. they're may, maybe he's so talking about like etheric. maybe he's etheric, and he didn't know how to talk about the etheric realm, which would seem like maybe a realm of fire. Everything's burning or on fire because it's just the fire of life. But he's like, oh, it looks like this guy was on fire, and he's crazy, but he's an etheric being, perhaps. So we have to we have to we have to think less subjective sometimes, you know. But the good question. Oh, here we go, cherry And We'll also notice too the Hebrew suffix in. On all these, that's how we know their orders are not specific cherubs. M is the plural, like Elohim. But yeah, so cherubim, be my strength in the name of Adonai. Here we're talking about the ninth sephira, Yasad, which is foundation. The angelic order that we're invoking is the cherubim, which loosely translates to the strong ones, the mighty ones sometimes. Um, and I wrote the, the names of God like this because in English we say, Lord God sent him, but in Hebrew, so it is yod heh vav -He Elohim sent Adam to till the ground. I also put that in there because Adam is made from the earth, and in Hebrew the earth is Adame, so it's Adam of Adame. It's kind of like, we kind of miss that poetic beauty there in English, but it's talking about this being being of this substance, so we'll go on, sorry. So yod heh vav -He Elohim sent Adam to till the ground that he was taken from, and he drove out the man and he fixed at the east of the Garden of Eden the cherubim and the flaming sword, whirling around to guard the way of the tree of life. That's from Genesis chapter 3, verse 23. Just as one example where you can see where we're getting these names from. And the ancient Kabbalists ordered them. I don't know what system they used to order them from lowest to highest, but they did order them. So then the divine name we're evoking, the divine name of the source is Adonai, which translates into Lord. And then this name is read aloud during Jewish services whenever the name yod heh vav -He appears, right? We've went over that before. So if in the Bible it says yod heh vav -He, so if it said yod heh vav -He, they're not going to say that. They're going to say Adonai Elohim. And then in English we're going to say Elohim is God. yod heh vav -He is read. Adonai is Lord. So Lord God sent him. That's where we get that from. Another interesting thing for a lot of these Hebrew terms, like, like Adonai, it's not only in reference to God. Sometimes there's a lord of a realm or a lord of a kingdom, and they call them Adonai as well. So there, there are some different, there are some interesting uh, interpretations you can take with the Hebrew scriptures. Then we have, Bene Elohim, be my brethren in the name of Christ the Son and by the virtues of Sabaoth. So this is the eighth Sephira, Hod, which is glory in English. The angelic order is Bene Elohim, sons of gods, or the, the sons of the gods. Bene being son, Elohim being gods. The divine name, we have Christ the Son. So we're talking about a son right here. We've got sons of God, so they're related that way. So this is from, from John, 
But as many as receive him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Um, so that's interesting. They believe that they, they took this word from this word. But I mean, this would have been written in uh, Greek and not in Hebrew. So a lot of the translation got lost when they went to Greek, first of all. This, this name actually appears in Genesis when they talk about the fallen angels who married, if you know the story, they, they married the, the wives of men and then they had the Nephilim, the giants, who were the sons of God, the Ben Elohim. It's also, this one comes up all the time in, if you've ever read the Book of Enoch, that one, it's, it's a non-canonical, so it's apocalyptic. It didn't make the Hebrew Bible. It didn't, obviously didn't make the, the Christian Bible, but they use it in um, Ethiopian or Orthodox. There's an interesting religion if you ever get into it. It's like a Christian Jewish mix from Ethiopia that has its roots to the actual Hebrew people. And they say it's from the, the marriage of King Solomon and the Queen of Sheba, who they said was, they assume is Ethiopian, like an actual history. That would imply that it's a historical fact, which I'm not trying to argue here. But it's just odd that the Hebrew religion sprung up here in the Holy Land and then over here in Ethiopia with no nothing in between it like that. It's interesting. But they're big on the, the, the Book of Enoch. The Book of Enoch talks about all these angelic orders as well. Now, later in time, early Christians and early uh, Jews condemn that book, saying you can't, you can't read the Book of Enoch. It's not cool. But it is kind of a cool book if you really get a chance to read it. It's hard to understand. But. So the divine name we're talking about is Sabaoth, which we know as hosts or armies. We hear this one a lot. So the Hebrew is Sabaoth, which means hosts or armies. Sometimes it'll be Yohei, Vauhei, Sabaoth, right? Or, or um, you know, the, the army of the Christ is basically the Christ Sabaoth or the virtues of Sabaoth being hosts or armies, like a multitude, like we talked about. Um, when we talked about Hokma on the microcosmic tree of life being the army of the Christ, this is the same kind of thing that we're talking about here. I just thought that it was interesting that this one came up in reference to Jesus, and he was the Son of God, and this is Son of God. And there's a lot of different, there's a lot of different references I can see starting to jump out when I study the Hebrew. Like in my mind, I think sometimes, okay, Yohei Vauhei would be like the source, the Ein Sof. The Elohim would be like our divine father who is in secret. Uh, Beni Elohim would be maybe someone who incarnated their father and now they're the son of that father. But I feel like it has more of those contexts or connotations in it, but not enough to say, this is what this means. You guys believe it. Memorize it. <laughs> you know, just, that's just my own interpretation, basically. So next we got Elohim, come back for me in the name of Tetragrammaton. So this is the seventh sephirah, which is Netzah, victory. The angelic order is Elohim. So right below them we have the sons of the Elohim, the Beni Elohim. Now we have the Elohim, gods, or God, plural. Right? This word Elohim appears more than 2,500 times in the Hebrew Bible and can refer to the singular God of Israel or to the pantheon of multiple gods, deities, angels, demons, prophets, and even mortal kings they they'll call Elohim sometimes. So it's interesting that this is, you know, this describes usually God, Yohei Vahe Elohim, it describes him as a God, but that angels are sometimes called Elohim, deities, demons, even negative aspects are called Elohim. Like uh, in the book of Genesis, it says when God creates, and he said, uh, th this word Elohim appears 32 times. And it's, and it's, so that's where they also get the 32 paths of mystical wisdom. But it's this word when they say, God said, let there be light. It's Elohim said, let there be light. So we're seeing there's a lot of names for God so far. They use this one for the name of God a lot. But the divine name that we're actually invoking in this line is Tetragrammaton, which is Greek, and it literally means the four letters. And the four letters it's always referring to is Yohei Valve. So this, this, this word right here is very divine, and it's the one that kept, kept getting covered and covered and covered, Yohei Valve. And they said, okay, let's just say Adonai. Now they always say Adonai in the synagogue, and outside they'll say Hashem, the name, and it's all referring to that. So it keeps getting these layers and layers of, of less divineness, but to keep that one really pure. And the whole idea of this name, too, yod heh vau -Hey, we always say yod heh vau -Hey. That'd be like me saying, we're talking about G-O-D. You know, I'm spelling it out, I'm not pronouncing it, because the actual pronunciation of this name is really disputed, and they think it is lost. 
used to be only pronounced once a year in the temple. So it would have been in King Solomon's temple and then later in Herod's temple, the second temple. Once a year on the Day of Atonement, which is, I believe, Yom, yeah, Yom Kippur, by the high priest would say it at 12 noon when he, he'd walk into the holiest of holies where apparently the Ark of the Covenant was and he'd pronounce this name, the actual pronunciation of it. And uh, the idea was 12 noon, he wouldn't cast a shadow. But uh, since the destruction of Herod's temple, some rabbis claim, no, it's still, you know, this name, is the pronunciation of it is still maintained within certain rabbinical circles. But uh, it's disputed whether it is or not. Yes. So is Jehovah or Jehovah not the pronunciation it's of it? It's not the pronunciation of it. No? Oh, I was going to say something more mysterious than that. <laughs> it is. Right. Jehovah is, and we'll talk about it, because I think that's the next name we're going to talk about, but Jehovah is anglicized. Okay. So you'll never find the name Jehovah appear in any Hebrew script or text or any Hebrew person, even any Jew, they wouldn't say Jehovah. It's not, they don't recognize it, and it, it comes from, it comes from, actually it comes from this word, with the vowel points for Adonai written underneath of it, as translated by a German scholar, so the, the Y would be a J. And then Adonai would be Yehovah, and that's, what, that's how they read it. Although the, the Jews say, no, that's not it at all. There are some secret societies that claim they have this. So. <laughs> Is that a big deal? That's a, that's a big deal in some secret societies. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to say which ones, anyways. Okay. So, <laughs> well, that's a big thing with the Masons, the pronunciation of that, what they say is still in there. Oh, okay, in that's the, what they say, cool. Yeah. That's, it's in, that's, that's, that's one of the big things. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. But whether it's the right one or not, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, mystery. Right. Yeah, those, those letters are also used as vowels in ancient uh, Hebrew, because there were no vowels, right? There's just consonants. But uh, the Vav is always used as an O, and the H has a, has like an H sound, like a so some people say it's the same as E O A that, that or E O A, yeah that, but that'd be like oh, all the vowels said at once. There's a lot oh, of speculation. Okay. I don't pretend. So to it know. can't be said from the physical plane. I understand. This is the idea, and the idea is that it is this name is supposed to represent something so divine that we're not even supposed to comprehend it, so they don't even try to pronounce it. That makes sense. That's what they say. <laughs> so next we got Malachim, protect me in the name of Jehovah or Jehovah, which is basically just what I said before. The six sephira, tifret as reclining, beauty in English. The angelic order is the Malachim, messenger of God, ambassador, or angel. This is what we talked about. This is this word always gets translated as angel, mostly always as angel, but that it means messenger. And in the Bible, it's not always used exclusively for an angel, like in the Old Testament. I mean. If there's a messenger of a king, he'll be called a Malachi. So... And he, Jacob, we're talking about, dreamed that there was a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels, the Malachim of God, Elohim, were ascending and descending it. And behold, the Lord, yod heh vav -Heh, stood above it. This is, from, this is from Jacob's ladder, the vision, Genesis 28, verse 12 to 13. So we can see, like we have been going over and over again, but in English we say the angels of God, and at the top of it was God, basically. But here we have two totally different words. The Lord was above it, Yodhi Valley, and the angels of God are the Malachim of, it, of the Elohim. So, I mean, you could, be, could, you could understand it on different contexts, for sure. Usually, if you want to know that the trick is that usually they, they, in English, in the Bible, if it's Lord, capital, L-O-R-D, it's Yodhi Valley. And every other time it's God, it's either Elohim, El, Eloah, all these other words. So the divine name we got here is Jehovah, which is said is the anglicized pronunciation of yod heh vav -Heh plus the vowel points of Adonai. Right? And it sort of makes sense if you think about this. It. It's not like it's wrong, but we're attributing this name to this highest source. So of course it's going to have a, a, a rank in divinity. We're maybe giving it its divine nature. And it is, we have the lowest divine nature of the name, then it's getting higher and higher because it's getting closer to this actual name, basically if you want to think about it that way. Or you can think about it however way you want. There's no rules. So basically, the next line is, Seraphim, purify my love in the name of Eloah. So we see Eloah, obviously, we know is pretty much akin to El and Elohim, but it's, it's a different version of it. So this is the fifth Sephira, Gaburah, strength. The angelic order is the Seraphim, the burning ones, 
It's also associated with serpents, as in fiery serpents. And it literally means fiery serpents, basically. Or it's used a lot of times to describe serpents, like in this one. Moses, make yourself a seraph and set it on a pole. In English, we say, make yourself a bronze serpent and set it on a pole. In the Hebrew, they're saying, make yourself a seraph, which we're saying is this burning angelic force, which makes more sense with the kundalini, I think, if the pole being the mm -hmm. spine, and the fiery serpent, which this seraphim actually means, we're basically talking about the kundalini, for sure. I mean, it seems a little more, it seems less allegorical that way when you say a bronze serpent and set it on a pole, with the, spot, the pole being the spine and the fiery serpent. Also, in, in that same story, it says God sent uh, serpents to bite the Israelites. Whenever they were bit by it, they died. But then if they looked upon the serpent on the pole, they came back to life again. The word for serpent the whole time they're using is seraph. The seraph, the seraph being, which is seen to be more angelic than the regular word for serpent, which is, which is like neshima or nesh, <coughs> neshim or something like that. So the divine name is Eloah. This is God, the, the word El, in, in a singular feminine form. There's a singular feminine form of Elohim, which is a pluralized form. It's found in the book of Job, generally referring to the God of Israel. So the Yohei Valhe being the God of Israel. The book of Job, there's a lot of poetic verses in there where they find where, where he says Eloah a lot. Other than that, it's not found too often in the, in the Hebrew Bible. I don't know why. So then we got Hashmulim, illuminate mute the splendors of Elohim and of Shekinah. So now we got has said, this, the fourth sifra has said, the angelic order is the Hashmalim, which translates as the electric ones. And it comes also from uh, the book of Ezekiel. I saw and behold, there was a stormy wind coming from the north, a great cloud with flashing fire and a brilliance surrounding it. And from its mist, like the color of Hashmal, often translated as electrum, from the midst of the fire. I think in English they translate Hashmal as copper or bronze, but it really has this connotation of being this electric kind of fire. And the Hashmalim would be the beings made out of this substance, basically, from Ezekiel chapter 1, verse 14. The divine name is Elohim again, which we found, we, we talked about that one uh, down here, I think, or up there. It was before anyways. So Elohim is God's, being the plural form of El, and the, also the plural form of Eloah, which is the feminine. Shekinah is the other name which is being uh, invoked here. And this is the divine presence of God, and it's seen, seen as feminine. The idea is that they built Solomon's temple, dedicated to God, and then the Shekinah came down and filled it, which is like the, the presence of God came down and filled this temple. So you can see it as maybe the Holy Spirit descending into your physical temple once you've erected the solar bodies. Arley Mack. Opening, revolve, and shine. Yeah, this thing's almost wrapped up here. So. This is the third sephira, Bina, understanding. The angelic order is the Aralim, the valiant or courageous ones, is what it translates into. Behold the Aralim, the angels of peace. It's not in the Bible too often. That's the only one I could find it in. But there's a longer passage that's talking about them crying and stuff, but I thought, ah, it's a little too down because, I don't know, Isaiah was, was, you know... <laughs> Prophesizing death and destruction, but that's where where our lane comes from. Yeah. So uh, the seraph, the, the sephira, second one. This is Hokma, wisdom. The angelic order here is Ophanim, which we were talking about earlier, which literally means wheels or the revolving ones. And that comes from this was the appearance and structure of the wheels of the Ophan. They sparkled like topaz, and all four looked alike. Each appeared to be made like a wheel intersecting a wheel. Ezekiel is a really hard book to understand. It's also the basis of Merkabah mysticism, the idea of this Jewish practice of trying to understand what this chariot looks like, and then by understanding what it looks like, that they themselves are experiencing this vision that Ezekiel had and becoming closer to God. It's called Merkabah, which is literally means chariot. But spirit like body. Spirit like body. That's the Merkabah, yeah, yeah. Cool. Yeah, exactly. So... And they, they, they attribute a lot, a lot of importance to the book of Ezekiel and Kabbalah and meditation. Because that's how they feel like, that's how you'll experience God. He had direct experience and it was this thing you can't really comprehend on the physical plane. And if you ever read that whole section, it has most of these angelic names in it and it's confusing. Yes. 
Actually, talking about the Ezekiel book, yeah. uh, Justin, you asked about the wheel. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. I read a book by Eric von Denken, and he he studied in depth uh, yeah. that book. So he was his interpretation was that that wheel was related to a spaceship. I've heard that one too. Yeah, 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 actually, I, yeah. I, I'm, yeah. I'm familiar with that the yeah. Eric von Denken's uh, yeah. interpretation. Into uh, physical something that's physical, yeah, exactly. Yeah. But yeah, I've heard that thing. Well, it's, it's interesting. It is really interesting. It does make sense. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We talk a lot about that. And the idea that the Elohim and Benny Elohim can be the gods, or maybe these gods are these aliens. Aliens. Yeah. I, aliens <laughs> you know, I generally don't go there with my lectures, but it can be taken that way for sure. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not above saying, "Oh, that's not right," because a lot of Samael's books would even point that way a little bit. And the Benny Elohim would be the sons of these aliens, maybe we're talking about genetic modifications and stuff like that. There is a strong case for, you know, if you ever see those ancient alien shows and all that, there's a lot, there is a strong case for an extraterrestrial presence. I feel like the understanding of the extraterrestrial uh, phenomenon isn't fully there yet, particularly with like what I would say, but I, I could only understand them on the fact that they would have to be higher beings, the aliens, as well as higher spiritual beings, so interdimensional too. That's one way I can kind of. No, that's the thing. It's uh, match it up in my mind. If you, if you read something like Eric von Däniken's yeah. work, it really shows how humanity can um, so easily misinterpret mm -hmm. um, spiritual text into sure. something that's physical. Sure. Because I mean, we don't know if they're if they're uh, physical or yeah. they're spiritual, or if, like you said, they maybe they're interpenetrating yeah. their boat. And if their technology is so advanced, and if they're so advanced, I feel like these spiritual laws we talk about here are universal laws. It'd have to be advanced in that aspect as well, and be subject to those laws as well. Although I know Steiner talks about them sometimes, the same that there's other beings whose lowest body is the etheric body, and they don't have a physical body, but they have a body that's higher. So, I mean, I've read different interpretations of the extraterrestrial phenomena, and if there are benevolent beings who follow the same spiritual laws that we do, then maybe they're higher spiritual beings and extraterrestrial beings at the same time. I just don't know too much about it. I'm not saying what's right and what's wrong. You, you never know. That's why I found Gnosis. You have to keep an open mind and you have to keep it open. And exactly. It's, it's all aspects. aspects. It's first-hand experience. You know? Sure. You can't say that it is or yeah. isn't something you can only be 50% sure yeah. until you experience it. Exactly. Exactly. Sure. And there's like, like we said, there's these great videos you can watch. You can watch one called The Seal of Truth where this Hebrew guy has a near-death experience and goes through all these things and meets all these orders of angels and stuff. So he's probably fitting into his interpretation of the world and the things he recognized. And if he was a Christian, he'd maybe see it as happy cherry bin that looked nicer and maybe that kind of thing. But the, the principles are still the same. <laughs> so here we go. This is basically the last line of this third round. It's Hayot HaKadosh, cry out, speak, roar, bellow. Here, if you notice too, we didn't invoke the name of the deity in the last two. It was just Arlie Mac, Ophanim, Revolve, and Shine. Just the way it is. So this is the first Sephira, Keter, crown. This is what the, this one is related to. The angelic order is the Hayot HaKadosh, the holy living beings, is what it literally translates into. So, and also from the midst came the likeness of four Hayot, living creatures. And this was how they looked. And then instead of writing an L out, this is where we get this interpretation of the four-headed being that has a man's head, a lion's head, an ox head, and an eagle head with wings that cover its body and wings that reach up to heaven. Stuff that's really hard to understand. They're, they're describing this being, so this Hayot HaKadosh, this holy living being, Hayot. Also later he explains this exact same looking being, but then says instead of the face of a man, it had the face of a cherub. So the cherub, the cherubim are also associated with this symbol a lot too. The idea of being the, and we talked, Ed, in Ed's lecture talked a lot about this, the bull, the man, the lion, the eagle, what it may represent. So this is where we get that from. If you read Ezekiel 1, uh, chapter 1, verse 5, they talk about it big time. And it, it goes on, it talks about their feet being straight feet with hoofs, and then the wings, and then the, the wings touch. And all these are actually connected, like what we just talked about was the color of Hashmil from the, from the center of the fire. And also from the midst of the fire came this. And there were, he was sitting on the river Cherub, which is the first reference to the word Cherubim in the Bible. So, I mean, it all basically comes from Ezekiel, and it's all hard to understand for sure. But they're talking about these angelic forces or higher powers and everything. 
So uh, sometimes we attribute this to Adonai, the angel Adonai. When we say that there's an angel Adonai, and he looks like this. I see that happen a lot. So you have to know this is the angel Adonai. Here's in, I don't know, maybe in Hebrew that would be an angel of Adonai, the Lord. But I mean, it's open for interpretation and for, you know, personal in-depth searching and looking. Meditate on it. You know, I, I don't have all the answers when it comes to this stuff for sure. But it's out there. And then we go on to Kadosh, 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 Shaddai, Adonai, Yot Shalom. So Kadosh is holy. That's where we got the last one was the Hayot HaKadosh. Hayot being living, Kadosh being holy. So here we're saying holy, holy, holy. Yoriva. These are usually, these words, like I said, how they're usually related to this name. So we're talking about God Almighty, God the Lord, and then Yod, Yod Haba being the Yod Haba, the divine male, female being, when you separate it that way. You know, Adam Yod Haba, the same thing. Yod being living, and Haba also meaning living, but in a feminine sense. So Kadosh, holy, is said three times, Kabbalistically, to bless the Creator and His messengers, angels, or forces, or His powers. In, the, in three specific levels of existence. Being the first, the world of Asiya, if you remember, that's the world of action. And then the second one being the world of Yetzira, the world of formation. This is from the first Kabbalistic lecture. And the third is the world of creation, Berea. Then there's the fourth world, which is absolute, the world of emanation, but it's admitted because it's apparently beyond the realm of angels and presence and more related to the realm of oneness. So that's that. That's why we say kadosh. And a lot of the prayers just say amen, amen, amen. We're always saying it three times. This is from the, he the Hebrew tradition why they, they say in their prayers all the time kadosh, kadosh, kadosh. Because they're blessing three the three levels of creation. Which can loosely be fit into categories that would uh, equal those seven levels, but then we're getting to like how the seven out of three, and then we're getting a little too technical, I think. That's just the origin of the saying it three times. Then we have Ehie, Asher Ehie, Hallelujah, 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 Amen, Amen, Amen. So again, we're doing the three levels, but the, this is the this is one of the highest divine names. Ehie, Asher Ehie, literally translates into "I am that I am." Basically, is what it translates into. And they will say to me, Moses, "What is his name? What shall I say to them?" And God, as Elohim, said to Moses, "I am that I am." Ehie, Asher Ehie, and He said, "Thus you will say to the sons of Israel." I am has sent me to you. This is seen as one of the highest divine names of God because they say this this name is the first person singular form of Haya, to be, which is to be. So this is the name that God calls himself, basically. But man wouldn't call him that because that would be like all men calling himself Justin. You know, like We're talking about Justin. We're not all Justin kind of thing. It's a different He would call himself, you know, Ahia. Yeah, it can also be translated as I will be who I will be. I am because I am, or I exist because I exist, because this AEA has the, the connotation of existence, to be. It's like, to be because to be, or to be that, to be, so it's kind of like that, yeah. So, so that implies, like, um, I'm, I'm not sure where I heard it from, but uh, the, the idea that uh, the abstract is abstract space, yeah. um, if it were, like, if it were some sort of uh, being, all it is is just the will to be. Yeah. So that's that's what it's kind of described. Exactly. It's, it's like is the only the yeah. only will ultimately yeah. is the will to be, and sure. then that's what results in creating yeah. yourself. And it's also it's associated a lot associated with the other side of the great I am, the Alpha, the Omega. So it's beyond time, it's beyond space, beyond confining it. It's just the only cause, the first and the last, the cause of existence. This is what this name implies. That's why it's related to the astral abstract. And that's the end of the invocation. Okay. Well, I put this one in here because you can see this picture that we all like. It has one of the wheels, one of Ezekiel's wheels seen from the chariots. I thought it would be cool. Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of like the beyond. Did you say um, hallelujah? What it means? Uh, I didn't say what hallelujah means. No. What it means? Uh, I didn't look in. Oh, okay. Maybe I should. I just, yeah, breeze over. It's like, oh, hallelujah. Is it just an expression? Hallelujah. Well, well, the so Yah so would be God, for sure. The Yod, hey. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I don't know. I can't, I can't decipher from my Hebraic knowledge. But. I think it, it's some sort of rejoice, like a, a claim. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or, I think um, it's God with us or something. Yeah. I can't remember. God with us or rejoice in God or something yeah. like that. Yeah. I can look into it. I don't mind. Mm -hmm.
and mm -hmm. also the word am amen. Amen. What is the Kabbalistic value of this word? Um, it's Aleph, Mem, Nun. So Aleph would be one. I have to go through it like Aleph, Mem. Uh, I have to, I have to, I have to think it over because I'm learning. Mem is 40, right? Uh, Aleph, Mem, Gimel, Dalad, Yeah, I think it is 40. Nun, nun, nun is 40. Ah, uh, we can talk about it after. I'll have to. If I sit there and no. use it on my hands, I can figure it out, but it wouldn't take me too long. But yeah. Um, yeah. So. So the, the invocation of Solomon, uh, it, or Solomon, it, Solomon. <laughs> so it goes through the process of, uh, of essentially going, going through the, the ten sphere of, uh, mm -hmm. three times. Yeah. So one for the, one for first the world of action, the world of formation, and then the world of creation. Is that what it's kind of trying to? You could, you, you could take it that way, and that's why it's say him in three times in Kadosh, three times. There's some pretty deep stuff in Kabbalah that I omitted from the lectures because it gets pretty confusing. Right. The idea that each sephirah is made up of the ten sephirah. Yeah. Well, more so, more so my question ten. is yeah. is just uh, uh, what the significance of going through the ten sphere um, three times is. Mm -hmm. like, it, would, it would be Kabbalistic. It would be for that reason. Okay. Yeah, that's that's that reason doesn't fit as well into Gnosis because we talk more about the seven dimensions, right. which do fit into those four worlds, but you're doing a lot of cross-referencing at that point. Yeah. Which may get confusing. Confuse an issue that doesn't really need to be confused. Mm -hmm. It's better to think of it in the seven dimensions, but in Kabbalah, each one of those dimensions has ten sephirah, and now we've gone through each one of them and blessed the beings of each one of them. Okay, because cause I've, I've read somewhere, um, I think it was the three mountains, that that the in the in rather than going through the, the sphere three times, you're going through the sphere with the Gnostic teachings seven times, actually. Seven times, yeah. Um, yeah, for each body. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. How it all links. It all links together. We're, we're using two different traditions, so sometimes it's hard. Yeah. You can explain Gnosis through Hinduism also, but then you also have to like, say, we've got these different names now, this name actually means this and that. Yeah, well, exactly. Numerically, it might not fit together, yeah. but obviously, I'm yeah. sure if you went through like what it's trying to teach and the process yeah. itself, it can be interpreted as either sure. going through the sphere seven times or three times yeah. or whatever. It's exactly. like all, you don't worry about numbers. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's getting pretty specific for, you know, stuff that's out there for us. Yeah. Like down the road for us. Like, we have a lot of work ahead of us. But, but Kabbalah and Gnosis are really linked together really tightly. Because in, in the very beginning of the Gnostic movement, they were all Kabbalistic Jews, right? Okay. So the first the first Gnostic text, if you read, like, the Pisces Sophia, they have these anglicized words like aeons and, and all these things, but they're, they're talking about specific sephirah, and they, they can line up really nicely because they, they were the, it was the Kabbalistic tradition past the time of Christ called, became Gnosis. They're basically one tradition. I, I, think, I think so. That seems that way. Yeah, because like in the Jewish tradition, they'd be like, no, we're not dealing with any of this Messiah stuff. Even though we're waiting for a Messiah, we're not, we want to be a physical, real Messiah that frees the physical, real world. They got a little bit literal there, I think, when Jesus came down and gave the teachings Kabbalistically, you could argue, because they interpret the Bible the same way, not a, not literal. If you see Kabbalah, it's not literal. He, he gave these teachings, but I guess they're waiting for something more literal. So they disregarded that, and Kabbalah became one thing, and Gnosis became something else. But they're both really linked together. I think. Is there any questions? Could the... Ten sephira be related to the ten hierarchical orders of the Judeo-Christian tradition? Yeah. Like the yeah. thrones, yeah. They the, are. They the have, nation, they have, they have direct the correlations. I just omitted that because I thought maybe I'm going to get into too many different languages and mm -hmm. traditions. Maybe I should have put that in there. But yeah, the early Mophanim. It's, it's a little confusing because sometimes the, the Christian tradition will call a seraphim is like lines up with an Ophanim or something. So it gets confusing that way. I didn't want to confuse the issue too much. And I've studied more Hebrew, but they do have exact, exact correlations. The ten Sephiroth, the ten, the Christian angel, angelic hierarchy can be related to the Jewish one. So the thrones, I think, are the Ophanim. What they call the Ophanim are called in Christianity thrones. And what they call Elohim, they'll call powers, like that kind of thing. But they have, they have like, the early Catholic Church has all these teachings too under different I do have a list if you guys want to see it sometime, I guess, of the exact cross-reference of what it is. It's out there. It's there. Sure. 
Sure, yeah, uh, sure. I, I mean, yeah, I didn't, I didn't want to say, I don't want people to feel like they have to memorize this stuff and then I would start throwing more names out and go, okay, wait a minute, we're talking about Keter, are we talking about the Ophanim or the Cherubims, what the hell's going on? I just want us to get a sense that, that these, these sayings have a purpose and that the purpose is a little higher and the purpose can be more internal and more external. But that you're not just saying it for dogmatic reasons. I want to get rid of the dogma, basically, because I, I left Catholicism personally because I wasn't down with dogma. I don't want people to feel like they're trading one dogma for another one. But it's up to you. It's up to the practice, right? I mean, everyone's going to walk their own path.